This could possibly be the most expensive vlog I have made yet. And it's all because of this little bad boy. Turns out SSDs do crash, do corrupt, and do fail. And I believe the ones with these little nubbins uh, are more susceptible to fusing out um, than others. And it's apparently quite difficult to retrieve data from SSDs more so than optical. And it's the second one that I've had uh, wig out on me. Completely different systems in the last six months, and I imagine they're a similar age. So you have been warned, kids. This is a replacement that will cost me about as much as the fee of the season I'm about to talk about. Inside number nine. Okay. Let's fire her up. Right. Um, recently, I've been trying to cut down on the amount of jump cuts and stuff like that. So this is just going to be a kind of almost like a, a fireside run through of the last season of Inside Number Nine, how I approached it, why I approached it, some little bits of technical stuff and um, some maybe tricks that I've, I've found. Um, but let me know what you think of this slightly less, I don't know, jumpy, YouTube-y kind of presentation where I'm just just kind of sitting here and it's vision mixed. So let's um, load up this very expensive replacement drive. And here we go to Inside Number Nine. And it's season seven. So Inside Number Nine, if you haven't seen it, I mean, do try and find it if you can, if you haven't seen it, because it's definitely some of the best telly I've ever worked on. It's an anthology series, which means each episode is totally different. So one week I can be doing a something set in the, the dark ages you know and then the following week I may be scoring like um, a call center in Runcorn or something like that it's uh, starring written by and sometimes directed by um, Reese Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton who are an absolute delight to work for it's nearly been going for 10 years I think we've done seven seasons uh, 43 episodes of which I've scored 41 uh, Vivaldi scored one and the other was set in a karaoke bar. So you'll see here that, and uh, this will not be news to those of you who've seen these tutorials already, but for a series that has this kind of, it's almost like it's got a multicam turnover as opposed to a drama turnover, I tend to have about a week and a half uh, to work on the scores, that's spotting, getting the initial ideas up sometimes, particularly if the concept is interesting. I'll get a proof of concept to a director and then score the whole thing, get notes back from everyone, producers, directors, Reese and Steve. Because we've been working on this for so long now, I tend to be trusted to deliver on those notes, but I'll be available when they're actually mixing the show uh, to do any last minute changes should they need. One of the key things about Inside Number Nine, which makes this all possible, is that I get a fully locked picture 99% of the time. Um, so this enables me to, to have a single computer audio file for the entire show, um, as opposed to separating out into different cues, cues being starts and finishes of music. You'll see here, it's just one tempo, no tempo changes, and I work very free. Uh, without being aware of the, the one is, where the one is, um, and simply subdivide or uh, go half time, double time, triplet time, that kind of stuff to change the pacing. All of these films tend to have a feeling to them. So I find by just finding the kind of rhythm of the piece, one tempo usually is, is fine. Okay, so let's um, start with the opening. This is Merrily Merrily, the first uh, episode. I can't show you uh, uh, moving pictures because I don't have the rights. Just a little bit of reverb. Now, I think I've got two types of reverb. I've got a, uh, just an insanely long one, 20 seconds, which is more of an effect reverb. 
and then your more standard, still massively long um, uh, kind of hall reverb. Now, the reason why stuff sounds so incredibly wet for TV and film is because when the actuality, the background noise, this is set on a lake, so there's going to be water, there's going to be trees rustling, obviously all of the dialogue. It's almost like a sponge. It just mops up all of the top end. And when you lose the top end, the first thing you lose is the sibilance of reverb. So this is why I tend to go absolutely nuts with reverb uh, for moving picture, because otherwise it can sound oddly dry. Uh, this also features the amazing Greg Lawson, if you know the Grit Orchestra, uh, who is um, playing these kind of rubato passages. Uh, I scored up what notes I wanted him to play and the kind of rhythm, but I didn't phrase anything. I just let him phrase it in a way that is idiomatic to the instrument. So let's have a listen to this. Now, it's interesting, something that I think a mistake a lot of people make when recording from their sheds like this or their bedrooms is, is to close mic the violin. Now, you hear it without the reverb. You can actually really hear the shed. That's the hall, and then this is the long one. I think the best way of trying to make something convincing, like I something recorded in a shed, sounding like it's put into a hall, is to record a diffuse signal, i.e. not close. A close signal, and I, I, you know, I love recording vocals close and pianos close and stuff, but you will find it so much harder to put them in a space when it's such a direct signal, because there's something quite artificial about, imagine just sticking your ear next to a violin, you're not really gonna hear the hall around you. So by basically, I think the meter, the, the microphone was about a, a meter away. Um, can't remember what mic I used, I think it was the U67. Um, uh, you, you create a diffuse signal, which for some reason uh, reverb glues to it better. So whilst it sounds a bit boxy and a bit sheddy, the minute you put the splosh on, uh, I think it's perfectly acceptable. This episode features Mark Gatiss. It was very moving to see him. He used to work with my mum and was bloody lovely to her, by all accounts. So slightly darker, more sulpont in the violin because things are taking a turn for the worse. I would say a feature of the inside number nines is that I tend to tend to keep it to a single theme for the entire episode and simply develop it and um, you know so this is a slightly more ominous version of what we began with and um, so it's not a whole bunch of like baddie theme and and I think it's because they tend to be in one environment. They, they're inside something that's numbered nine. So as a consequence, you're not going to different locations with different characters. You're always in the same location. So I think that homogeny is very important. So you're not flinging just loads of different themes and, and sounds at, at, at the screen. So a moment of reflection there. I think what also happens 
is the the viewer actually has an affection for the piece of music and it doesn't distract it's just oh that's developing and you'll see that we return after this synth fest here to greg and what we've done or what i've done is developed just some very simple chords underneath that just take you somewhere else so let's have a, just a little listen to this synthy bit Simple rising chords, Cafe Del Mar chords. Bringing Greg back in here, tying the thing together. It's quite big here. Again, going back to the reverb thing, this is underneath a firework display, just about as much top end as you can get, which is why there's this just endless uh, reverb on it. When I've worked with professional engineers when they're mixing films it's incredible how much reverb they put on it don't be shy it will sound so disappointing it's two things it's not only the white noise the actuality that rubs out the top end they will run it quieter than how you monitor it it's just inevitable and again when things are turned down the reverbs tend to disappear if i were to ever make an album of this stuff i would go back in and just just simmer it back a little bit so that there is um, a, a slight more degree of, of, of um, definition. So we just have a listen to this last bit. So I bring a drum in. So that's the first time. But there is a new character here. very mysterious and then I think do I modulate here no Something I've been playing with of late is just trying to help tell the stories because we're part of the storytelling team, the, the music department, and I've got a new philosophy and that is to try and tell, help tell the story as simply and as directly as possible. I've completely abandoned any attempts to be cool and understated. Um, if they want emotion, I'll give them emotion in the simplest and most direct direct form. But also, it's a very moving story, this. And I think by just, instead of showing off and doing, you know, synth gymnastics at the end, by just settling on a simple piano um, is, I think, the most effective way of helping people to reflect on what is quite a moving story. 
And um, just as a tip from you to from me to you, um, I, I'm starting to do scores where you'll have entire cues, which will be a single instrument. And directors and producers just always love that kind of pared down simplicity. And what you'll find is that your music will be played louder. If it's very complex and very detailed, it can be very distracting and it can really interfere with dialogue. So again, I'm not trying to impress myself with music anymore. It's all about helping to tell the story in the simplest, least pretentious, um, most direct way. And also something that I'm, I'm a great believer in is you must write music that the characters you're trying to underscore, the characters you're trying to empathise with, you must write music that they would respond to. Right, let's get cracking. Just some very simple string parts there. Everything's going to be lovely, lovely school. What Alice is great at doing is acting with her cello. And again, I don't phrase anything for her. She just watches the screen. Unfortunately, for this bit, a bit of a modulation. I forgot to warn her that this is Reese Shearsmith going through about 10 Polaroids of men's penises. And let's just have a listen to the last, but I'm just wondering if we did some... Oh yes, this is exciting. So this is uh, Alice Allen on the uh, cello doing um, basically um, chopping, which is like a, a bluegrass technique. freaky. It doesn't end on score though, it ends on a song and this is just was bonkers to do. Okay, it's difficult without you seeing this, but basically they're singing it on screen. So uh, we did a pre-record, which they mimed to. Then we re-recorded the singers with some stage school kids. And um, the reason why the drums are kind of sounding a bit out of time and stuff is I foleyed all of the drums and moved them around and stuff. I think you can possibly see... Or did I? Yeah, there's some really incredible uh, mad uh, panning there, just so that it kind of moves with the picture. So let's carry on here. And then moving outside here. So I want to give a sense, there's lots of villages outside we don't see.
There we go, the odd things that we have to do as composers. This has got a kind of procedural feel about it. These loops by my brother and his writing partner Alexis, they're in, they were in Iceni and they might get out of jail free. So cool. to plug in kicking in for the first time. So you'll see that's a repeating theme that'll come back. Again, Anna's so fantastic because she, she really acts with her instrument. Um, I wasn't able to get a picture of this, but it was just some, some, some rough guidance. Beautiful guitar playing from Theo, uh, aforementioned assistant. Lots of split screen stuff, amazing uh, directing and uh, a fabulous cast as well. And um, it was all about hitting the, the different cuts and stuff. Some great twists. So we'll need to make all of those steady outs. <laughs> You'll see this rhythm that you're not hearing. If we just sam uh, send this out so you can hear it, it's this strange rhythm here. Made of some samples that I think I made. Um, so let's put that back where it was. And what that's doing is going to an auxiliary here and we'll see when this bit comes in, that it's it's using the side chain of bus one here, so that you basically create this tuned rhythm, synthy kind of sound. So here it comes.
Mm. What's great about this is, I, you know, if we modulate, I can just literally change the, 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 the key that it's playing. It's just currently playing a single note. Um, but, uh, let's see, here we go. Every cliche in the book. So that vocoder there is moving again along with the strings. Just have a look at the audio here. And I put a bit of distortion on there. The reason I put distortion on is to create upper harmonics so that you can hear it on a phone. It's simple as that. Um, sounds a bit grungier as well. And it's interesting, if I play you this loop, which is part of the Hammers library, which I'm just caning at the moment, it's such a workhorse uh, library. That, you're not gonna hear that on most, most TV. Um, I mean, it's so great. You'll hear the crack, but it, it, it really is not gonna come through uh, most TVs and certainly not uh, a phone. You might get a sense of something ticking away, but it's very, very subby. So what I've done is I created an actual harmonic two octaves above and then blended it. So let's do that. and I quite enjoy the little glitches there as well, but that basically makes it a lot more audible. Now I could really tempo map this so it's hitting all the cuts musically, but you can also use tricks like um, that reverse kind of bell thing there um, to hit a cut dramatically, but in a way that isn't particularly musical. So this is a new rhythm. So this is a synth. Now, what am I doing that? I've got the compressor side chaining, or have I? Yes, bus one. So basically, this rhythm not only is it doing this vocoder pattern, but it's also side chaining the compressor on this sound. giving it a kind of a, an interesting texture, which or when, when you put it all together. There it is again, brown nervy. frame loops. Here's another reverse. So these are two identical, these sounds, but I'm just pitching one up against the other.
So I'm playing this absolutely dead straight. Very rare. I mean, it's really funny this episode, but I very rarely play, play the comedy. Uh, my family's a big fan of Buster Keaton. In fact, my youngest brother is called Keaton after Buster. So I believe in keeping a straight face, and it kind of makes it even more absurd because we're really throwing everything at it. Uh, I think there might be even some Brahms coming. This vocoder technique is something I used extensively in that Tony Scott film, Spy Game. It's a kind of heroic moment, which is absolutely ridiculous. So let's have a look. Did I do some Brahms? So just a lot of hammers there. Uh, let's just have a look at the, the, the different parts going on here. So we've got the loop. Subtle stuff. And a bram there. This is from uh, the stack. Massively cheesy Tony Scottish kind of uh, procedural absolutely brilliant episode and a lot of fun to do and again uh, just did it at a single tempo didn't do massively complex tempo max but I'm hitting a lot of cuts and when they really don't fall where I want them to I'll do a little trick of like a reverse bell and stuff like that which makes makes it all feel like it's ticking along nicely I could have spent a month working on this, just this one episode um, alone, but we just simply don't have the benefit of time. So you've got to use those little tricks to get you out of jail free um, when you're working at pace, um, which is something that we all have to do from time to time, particularly anyone who's replaced a composer on a, on a project. Uh, you find that you have very little time to do stuff that needs to look quite kind of complex and like you've spent some time on it, as my brother used to say to me. Random Acts of Kindness was a science fiction. Um, I won't dwell too much longer because I want to get to Mr. Owl, but Random Ca Acts of Kindness was definitely their first um, science fiction themed uh, thing uh, br brilliant brilliant catch at the end as well which leaves you leaves you thinking so is this going to load and play and behave new uh, template and we've got a 100 tempo 120 tempo and uh, let's just kind of work through what we've got going on here <laughs> using a tremolo and using lots of uh, lovely synthy stuff. Uh, not as much music until later on here, but again, just going along the kind of Brian eno -y route, I believe. Put Squid A there because I think it sounds a little bit like uh, Squid Games.
unusual for me because it's actually a development um, as in a kind of a second subject and so this funny sound here and this will will end this episode on this sound but is kind of like a piano and I've duplicated it and then I put this vocal transformer on which just doesn't like it when you play chords in a good way so let's go off and then on so again like a little upper harmonic for the main piano part My cards are running low, so I'm just going to end quickly on Owl, which I think is the darkest one I've ever worked on. Uh, what was fun was this one is it features um, basically old public information films, which I grew up with. So they kind of, I had an idea in my head what they should sound like. Um, and it was back in the days where, uh, back in the days when, um, everything was a little bit kind of um, atonal and stuff. So you'll basically see all of this stuff here is going out of bus two, and that's going into this little cassette thing. I thought I put it through a lo-fi junkie. I clearly didn't. Um, and it just makes it all sound a bit crap, but in a good way. So let's have a listen to this. So ostensibly there's kind of two scores going on here. I've made it mono. So you can hear, it's just me playing very free. And then we've got the other score, which is much more of a traditional orchestral thing. Kitchenware. So this was a quintet. Lots of reverb. And I just I just let it sit above the fake strings. Still sounds pretty big. It's the bass that helps that. And then the quintet helps create these lovely... Those lovely slides, even though the samples aren't doing that. Let's just finish on this nice, emotional...
just a little uh, music edit there at the end. But uh, as we started and ended, um, shamelessly, not sentimental, but, but emotional. And that's, I think, we've not gone that way with Inside Number 9 thus far. And uh, it was interesting to investigate and enjoy that with Reese, Steve and the team. Um, are we going to another season? Yes, we are. I have received uh, notice that um, they start shooting soon, I think, uh, season eight. And I think there's going to be a season nine as well. And um, hopefully they'll have me back for that one too. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's a joyous thing to work on. Uh, brilliant material, amazing scripts, directors, producer. The, all of the actors are incredible. Reese and Steve are a delight to work with. And um, yeah, I consider myself very, very lucky to be part of this, what I would refer to as a kind of a TV phenomenon, really. Uh, absolutely brilliant, challenging, and a whole heap load of fun. I hope some of this has been useful. I hope I haven't waffled too much. And um, so I'm just looking at one, one of my cards gone already, but it's just the screen, so that's fine. Um, and uh, but I do read the comments down below. So if you have any questions about my process and approach, do not hesitate to put a question and I'll endeavour to answer and anything you'd like to see in the future. Was this too long, too short, too waffly, not edited down enough? I'd also like to know that because I'm thinking of starting maybe doing some live streaming um, that uh, you can ask me questions live. And again, it'll just be bloke in shed sharing his thoughts on um, writing music for, for TV. Subscribe if you haven't done already. Ding that bell to be notified the next time I put something up. And one of those for the incredible talents involved with Inside Number 9. See you next time. Bye-bye.